The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, uptimers and downtimers battle for the new world. A young queen faces down evil forces allied against her. And as World War I comes to a close, a German general, an escape prisoner of war, and the crew of an airship converge to effect the Romanov rescue, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your new podcast host, David F. Shariarod. Today, we bring you a conversation moderated by our guest interviewer, Josh Hayes, with Tom Kratman, Justin Watson, and Casey Azell about their new novel, The Romanoff Rescue, which has an on-sale date of November 2nd, 2021. That's next Tuesday if you are listening to this episode of the Bain Pre radio Hour as it debuts. The novel is an alternate history that asks the question, is a world without global communism possible? Stay tuned for the author's answer to that question and more. But first, the news. The November mass markets are on bookseller shelves everywhere. Let's take a look. First up, we have 1637, No Peace Beyond the Line by Eric Flint and Charles E. Gannon, a entry in the best-selling Ring of Fire series. It's 1637 in the Caribbean. Uptimer from 20th Century America, Commander Eddie Cantrell and his ally and friend, Admiral Martin Tromp, start the year with some nasty surprises for Spain, whose centuries-long exploitation and rapine of the New World has run unchecked. But Imperial Spain is determined to possess the new black gold of the Americas in the form of crude oil pouring out of the Allies' pumps on Trinidad. Now, the battle for the New World has begun, and it is a fight to the finish. We also have Serpent Daughter by author, guitarist, and sometimes podcast guest interviewer, DJ Butler. Serpent Daughter is the fourth book in Dave's Witchy War series. Sarah Calhoun has taken her father's throne and ascended into her goddess's presence in unfallen Eden as her father never did. But the queen may be dying. Forces are allied against her from without as well as from within. To survive, Sarah must enact an ancient rite that will propel her beyond mortality and lend her strength to fight. The queen may be dying, true, but if she is, she will go down fighting for the only thing that matters. At 1637, No Peace Beyond the Line by Eric Flint and Charles E. Gannon and Serpent Daughter by DJ Butler, both out now in mass market paperback. And that. For the month of October, we've got scary good deals on Bane Books Anthologies. It's the Anthology Galactica October ebook sale. Perhaps nothing highlights the ideas of science fiction and fantasy quite as well as the short story. Bane Books has long kept the short story alive and delivering the sense of awe and wonder SF and fantasy is known for. Throughout October, get these hot anthologies for a cool price. Get $2 off Weird World War III and Cosmic Corsairs and $1 off over two dozen more anthologies. Check out Bain.com for details. The sale ends October 31st and these discounts apply wherever Bain eBooks are sold. And that's it for the news. And now we bring you our interview with Tom Kratman, Justin Watson, and Casey Azell about their new novel, The Romanoff Rescue. But first, let me introduce our third guest interviewer, Josh Hayes. You may recognize his name from the cover of Battle Luna, which he co-wrote with Travis S. Taylor, Timothy Zahn, Michael Z. Williamson, and Casey Azell, or from the many covers of his many other books, including the Valor Trilogy. He is a Dragon Award nominee, and if you're a devoted podcast listener, you're likely familiar with him from his live writing podcast, Keystroke Medium Live. We're excited to have him bringing his interview skills to the radio hour. 
Welcome, Josh. Now let's take a look at your interview with Tom Kratman, Justin Watson, and Casey Azell about the Romanoff rescue. Hi, and welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. Uh, I am Josh Hayes, and this week's interview is the Romanoff Rescue with Tom Krautman and Justin Watson and Casey Azell. Uh, it's going to be a great uh, interview, and I'm glad you're here to, to join us on this week's episode. Uh, we're going to start out with some introductions. Uh, Tom, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your writing career? Okay. Well, I've had a lot of different careers. Writing's just the latest one. Uh, I'm from <laughs> South Boston, Massachusetts, and I'll tell you right up front: in South Boston, life ain't easy for a boy named Cratman. You grow up hard, you grow up mean, your fists get fast. I'm sure you know the rest of the song. Um, joined the army when I was 17. Uh, army sent me back to school. Went back in as a lieutenant. Uh, current. I'm a retired field grade lieutenant colonel. Nobody important. Uh, recovering attorney and. Um, for the last 20 or so years, a writer for Bain. Excellent. Uh, Casey, how about you? Uh, so I'm Casey Zell. Um, I am um, a active duty Air Force helicopter pilot. Um, I will uh, get getting ready to retire next year, probably. Um, not probably, definitely. It's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, Going back and forth. <laughs> and... Um, uh, yeah, I uh, um, started writing in 2010 um, when I uh, wrote a story for a Bain anthology called Citizens, um, and was uh, was uh, excited to ha to have that accepted. And um, um, yeah, just been writing ever since. So excellent, uh, Justin. Uh, hi, Justin Watson. Uh, if Tom's nobody important, I'm definitely no one of consequence. I got out of the army as a captain uh, before they <laughs> even give you the lobotomy between <laughs> captain and major. Uh, was a field artilleryman for 10 years, uh, did a couple tours in Iraq, one in Afghanistan. Uh, I've been writing for a while, writing with some degree of success for a couple years now. I have a uh, Short fiction out with Bain uh, in uh, Tom's anthology, Terra Nova. Casey's in that one, too. Uh, a couple of Mad Mike Williamson's anthologies and some stuff from Chris Kennedy. And really excited. This is my first novel. So I'm really jazzed to be here. He Excellent. was drooling all over Facebook the day he got oh, yeah. <laughs> I bet he yeah. was. I bet he was. Shameless plug. -in. There's actually a copy on my desk at work. Like, just the, the not even bothering to humble brag. Nice. As there should be. As there should be. <laughs> Uh, well, you guys are lucky because this is my first interview that I'm doing for the the Bain podcast, and uh, I lucked out because I'm really good friends with uh, Casey, and I'm looking forward to to building relationships with you guys, and I'm eager to talk to you guys about the book. I just finished reading it this morning. It's a great, uh, phenomenal book, uh, well written. Um, I'm I'm really curious about the the different parts that you guys had in 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 writing and developing this book. Um, but right on the outset, Tom, would you tell us a little bit about the idea, the the concept behind this novel and, and what that idea grew into to this full, uh, I mean, man, it's a massive tome, almost 600 pages. <laughs> you think that's massive? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's after a lot of okay, it, it started with a question from Mona Lisa, who who is on the inside cover, but she's not in the outside cover. Yeah. Um, and she wrote the Tatiana interludes. Oh, okay. And, gotcha. and she wanted to have the Night Witches, a, a Soviet light bomber group um, from World War II, be an Imperial Russian or at least a non-Soviet light bomber group. And she asked me how to do that. I thought about it for a while. And the ultimate, I tried different ways. And the ultimate answer was, you've got to save the Romanov dynasty. Interesting. And then started thinking about that. And I think Justin and I started kicking it around just as kind of a fun point of conversation. And then it was kind of like, you know, I think we got a book here, especially since there's another book I've been wanting to write for about 50 years now <laughs> that, um, that will fit into this very nicely. And so is this a, is this a, a going to be an, an ongoing series or at least a, a number of books? Look for these two to finish it up 10 years after I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because it is, I mean, it's alternate history. It's set in, in World War One, or at least the uh, the time period of that. Um, 
the the places and locations are real uh the characters aren't um uh, but some are some, some are. are um so that was the general idea uh what led you through um you know uh I've got I've got notes here because I could not pronounce. I I tried writing them out phonetically, and then I was like, I'm not even going to try. To, to, and I have to say that this is the first book that I've read that I I don't think I came across a single American character, and there might have been one in here, but I don't think I found one. And that was interesting to me on a reader level because it really set it into okay, this is um, in Russia, in Germany, and it's a legit like it's it's no american coming in and bringing a great idea like these are uh russian and germans a as a book about them and i like that uh but you have uh Kostay kostayechov kostayechov kostashakov that's that's exactly what i said yeah. um his intro chapter <laughs> was amazing the uh the escape from uh well the, the attempted escape uh and then getting uh stabbed in the butt by, <laughs> by, I did not see that coming. I'll be, I'll be fair. I did not see that coming. Neither did Kostya Shakov. <laughs> uh, the, the real Kostya Shakov is is Dan Sh Kostya Shak, West Point class of 1980, and he died of cancer about nine years ago. And I'm kind of annoyed that he's dead, so I brought him back to life. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, so talk about the characters. Talk about the 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 development of the different ones because uh, you have. Several POV characters in here. You've got the Tatiana interludes that happen from her perspective. Um, you've got several characters doing any number of things. Um, what was the what was your favorite, uh, Tom? And then we'll go to, to Justin and Casey here. Who's your favorite characters to develop out of the book? Ooh, um, I've got to give a little short lecture here. <laughs> uh, very short, very short. Um, the thing that distinguishes romance from most other kinds of fiction is that the romance itself becomes a character. Hmm. One of the things that distinguishes mill sci, mill sci-fi and military alternate history is that the organization is a character, the preparation is a character and the operation is a character. Now me personally for various, you know, uh, intellectual and moral flaws, I love preparation for this kind of thing. So it's probably my favorite character is, is pulling everything together logistically, training wise, organizationally, leadership wise, planning wise, reconnaissance wise, pulling all that crap together and it becomes a character. And I'd say that does show very well in the book. The 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 um, expertise, as it were, to to be able to handle all of those different aspects of the operation, like. Uh, water or food or little things like putting a horse on a zeppelin which i would <laughs> never have thought about the logistics of that that was um i got this because uh i needed to know how the damn german hand grenades felt before we could turn them into flashbacks and how uh, they were built yeah. it's not real okay yeah it's painted green but no it's it should be blue in this in a sane universe uh for those just listening, Tom has a grenade. Like the, <laughs> the explosive is out of it, but he has a grenade. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, how, how, the hell you, are. <laughs> how the hell are you going to discuss turning a German grenade into a flashbang unless you have a grenade? Right. <laughs> you know, how do you do that? Those were some of the fun. Uh, they obviously they they trained for this mission. I don't want to get too. <laughs> Now he's just writing in character. If you're listening on the uh, the audio <laughs> version of this podcast, do yourself a favor and go find uh, on the Bane YouTube channel this video. And when, <laughs> right now we're at nine minutes and seven seconds into the interview. And I don't know where it's going to fit on the podcast, but Tom is writing in character now. And that's all I'm going to say. You just need to go watch the video because that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I had to know how these things felt, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> the things writers do to get in character. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Justin, talk about um, some of the character, uh, some of the characters that maybe you developed or had fun writing and, and working with on this project. So my. Um... My primary responsibility for these was for this book was the the guards Chekhov and Dostavolov. Okay, um, I got the easy Russian names to pronounce. So. Right, <laughs> uh, to totally didn't plan it that way or anything. 
Right. Um, so Chekhov and Stavlov were uh, my guys to develop, and I had so much fun writing them that Tom told me to delete fifty percent of what I wrote. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, it's true. I, I did over. I you know my imagination got carried away with me. I you know tried to jump inside these guys' heads, really get to know uh, where they'd come from going all the way back to the great war, you know, like these guys are both great war veterans who ended up on the Romanov's guard detail. So I wrote segments with them in the great war and it properly, it was not part of the, the novel proper. So we had to cut those out, but I loved them, you know, enjoyed right. writing. Um, so one of the things I'm a new writer, but one of the things I find I, I really enjoy doing and seems to resonate well with my audience is um, I love writing junior enlisted guys and NCOs. Uh, cause yes. that's why I was in the army for 10 years. Like, uh, commanding troops keeps you young. If you let yourself enjoy it and don't focus too much on the politics. Right. Um, so Chekhov and Dostavlov, uh, little harder edged, they're great war veterans and they're living through the Russian civil war. So they're having a rougher life than you might have in a standard, uh, 21st century American unit, but still in spirit, they're still the same troops that, you know, Casey, Tom and I have commanded. Um, and that's, they're, they're both you know, um, very sardonic in the Russian manner. So that makes them fun. And they're, they're very different personalities. So that, that was fun for me. Um, and they, I mean, they both affect the course of history as soldiers are wont to do. Well, and it's interesting when you mentioned those two characters, um, reading the book and having finished the book and, and again, no spoilers, I, it, those two characters uh, on an emotional level, I think were the, the two characters that I think grew most in the book for what they went through and then what they, the choices that they had to make. And then ultimately what happened, that happens when everything, you know, uh, when it's the sequel matter hits the rotary air. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you'd um, seen them as Justin originally wrote them, they grew a lot more. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I still maintain that we're going to see that, that those cut scenes in a, story of some kind someday so. anthology i think yeah that kind yeah. of that uh because they they i mean i think all of the characters had uh uh interesting backstories that we could have made whole novels in, in and of themselves i mean even the yeah. the flight crew on the zeppelin uh um, mm -hmm. you know and and we didn't get a lot uh of interaction with them at the beginning uh you you get a couple of chapters with them and then kind of dotted throughout the book but uh man you could have done a whole i mean the whole africa mission at the beginning mm -hmm. could have been its own thing in and of itself uh and i kind of again that speaks to the the uh the amount of detail and um uh forethought that went into writing the scenes because those scenes are pretty detail oriented which I assume that that's how you live your life, Tom, <laughs> is uh, is in the wit in the de details. In the no, she, she wrote the Zeppelin stuff. She that was, that was her. Yeah, I didn't put her in there, but it was her. Uh, well, that makes a lot of sense because uh, being a pilot, you would know that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, so I'm not a Zeppelin pilot. <laughs> no, but you've got some of the basic ideas and problems and outlooks. Well, well, unlike but, a grenade or a helmet, it's kind of harder to get a uh, lighter than airship. Yeah, right. a little bit. I tried. But... We thought about it. We did think about well, it. but again, you 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 have these issues in the book where you're talking about weight and yeah. um, like especially like how are we going to hang people in a hammock and don't move and uh, you know those aerodynamics are the same all the way around and so are yeah. physics. Uh, well, let's talk about that. What? How was that? Uh, how was that like going into this book and and working on those scenes and what did you enjoy most about those? Um. So the. <sighs> There's a couple of things that I really enjoyed about about writing the the airship crew. Um, one of them was something that like it, it kind of became apparent after it was all after we were close to done and, and I saw kind of the compiled thing is that, you know, it it turned out almost accidentally. And I think this is Tom's this is a little bit Tom's genius and being like, hey, Casey, you're a pilot. You got to write the flying shit. Because at, at the first, I was like, Tom, yeah, I'm a pilot, but I don't fly zeppelins. Like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know anything about those, you know. Um, but he was like, well, be a big girl and look it up. Um, so, uh, so I, uh, so I did um, uh, with his help a little bit, and um, um, and it was really, really fun to research it. But 
the um, so that was one of my favorite parts was actually learning what I did get to learn. But once it was all compiled and once it was done and I could look at my chapters with the airship crew next to Tom's chapters about the, um, you know, the preparation and the training um, and Justin's chapters about Chekhov and, and Estavalov. The thing that like hit me was like, holy crap, this is a really great illustration of how air crew are different than mm. infantry. Like our, right. our mentality is different. The things that we're concerned with are different. And, you know, there's a lot of inter-service rivalry always, of course, um, and a lot of, you know, ribbing that goes back and forth. But the truth of the matter is that, like, you know, we consider ourselves to be experts in what we're doing and, and for good reason, um, just like these guys on the airship did. That was their that was their ship. That was they were the experts in doing it and they were intensely competent about it. Um, but their outlook and their, their their way of approaching problems was was just slightly different than the. Um, you know, than the infantry guys. And I, and I, I really, I was like really happy that that came through so clearly, you know, almost by accident. Um, but yeah, that was, so that was a really fun part of it. The other really fun part of it was just going back to the research, that whole Africa ship mission, that's real. Like that actually happened. Um, and there were, there were a lot of, yeah, it's, um, to this day, it may, it holds the record, the L59 holds the record for the Longest, longest lighter than air combat mission ever. So, really? um, yep, to this a record day. record unlikely to be broken. Right. <laughs> true. I mean, we don't do a lot of lighter than air combat uh, missions <laughs> anymore, but, um, oh, but, but still, it's super cool. Yeah. It's, it's still kind of badass. Right. And so learning about that and, and digging into the details of what exactly happened on that mission, there was a lot that um, I kind of had to like condense just to, you know, make it. We didn't want to go over 700 pages, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, learning learning about all of that was 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 actually really enjoyable for me too. So, uh, so one of the things that just popped into my head when you were talking about the expertise in in what they're doing and how they're different from the infantry guys, it was it was interesting during the the training parts of the book where. Um, uh, I'm going to mess up his name again. Kost, Kostai Shakov. Kostai Shakov? Kostai Shakov. There you go. Uh, they're, they're running through the different scenarios and they're running, like, like looking at logistically, how do we go in here and do this? And like you say, they, the doing the flashbangs and, and how the German grenades could be modified to do that. And, and, um, doing basically a trial and error on on what works but then also these guys had never done that before like close quarters combat wasn't really a a, a trained thing in in world war one like going through um like we would train like uh uh special operations guys like the seals or anything else to go through um so it was really interesting to see props. those um the what i said tom's going for more props now yeah yeah <laughs> this was close yeah. combat yeah exactly right uh and 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 so the, the the trial and error that they went through and even the the um like he's instructing these guys this is what you're going to do and then they go and do it but they obviously they don't do it because it's something they haven't done they haven't practiced and seeing that growth in the men and then the knowledge in the leadership that this is how we have to train these guys to do it and then how they developed their training uh programs through that that was a really good um arc to that whole section of the book uh so my question is then what kind of research did you do i mean uh in looking at the, the training We're just like yes we agree yes so <laughs> the, the question is in in setting all that up, did you research a lot of the World War One training or the the combat, or, or did you just take it from your own experience in uh, in the military? Yes. <laughs> this is a super easy interview. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm the only grunt here. A lot of it was mine, but I went back into like I got a reprint of the Lewis Machine Gun Handbook. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. For what it was, ever it was, seventeen different kinds of stoppage you can get with a Lewis gun, <laughs> you know. And so that training period that comes from the Lewis gun. The um, 
the drill with the little 37 millimeter cannon. Those also came from a World War One manual. The uh, and this was brilliant. I don't know why the hell I didn't think of it as a captain, but the way to get a moving erratic moving target that came from a World War One manual. I'd never heard of it. It was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and we like Tom really quarterbacked that whole segment. But what I found interesting to, to as the, I'm not a grunt, I'm an artilleryman and proud of it. But we all ended up doing block to block, house to house, city stuff in Iraq, right? Like everyone yeah. who was a combat MOS and a lot of people who weren't uh, ended up doing that just for less important targets. You know, you would save, you know, your HVTs for the, uh, the, the tier one and other special operations. And then people like us would go after the small fry. Right. Right. Um, and the, the trick and what Tom did brilliantly is from what we know now, after years of urban combat with firearms uh, and grenades and other modern equipment is we have, you know, highly refined tactics, techniques, and procedures for fighting in a city that, as you kind of pointed out, Josh in 1918, they would have been much more primitive Right. So what Tom did a brilliant job doing, in my opinion, is figuring out what they realistically could have figured out planning for a fi- planning for 100%. this rescue mission yeah. when there had been no mission like it in history yeah. up to that point. You know, like this is the first, arguably the first modern, now that we're in this alternate universe timeline we've created, I would argue this is probably the first modern special operation, you know, of in, in this era, in, the, in this universe we've created, like, you know, the raid on Entity is decades in the future. All the SAS, SAS stuff is decades in the future. You know, these guys are the one of the first modern commandos. I mean, other than the Boer War, you know, South Africa. Well, and, that's, and that goes to the aviation side of things, too, because mm-hmm. in essence, this mission with the, the Zeppelin is a big ass air assault mission. That's yeah. it. Right. And so right. a lot of the same considerations, you know, we had some of the same conversations Um Tom, if you remember about, okay, this is what the air crew is going to be worried about. They're going to be worried about someone in the trees lighting up their bag as they're, as they're coming into land in this unprotected field. So they're going to need some kind of security presence to secure that LZ. Um, That's stuff I know as a helicopter pilot, but that's, you know, we had to work through them kind of figuring that out um, because, you know, that was not what Zeppelins were used for necessarily. Um, They weren't, you know, they weren't used to shuttle troops. They were used as cargo carriers. So bomb carriers mostly. and bomb carriers. Yeah. It's a uh, Casey. You said this before we went live and it was a, it's a really apt description of, of this book um, where I'm uh, I, I write mill sci-fi in case you also write mill sci-fi but all, a lot of my stuff is is action oriented um like like a michael bay movie with marginally <laughs> better dialogue as richard fox would say i'm um, sure it's more than marginally I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, you, know, you seem like a nice guy josh i'm just gonna give I, you better than marginally i appreciate that <laughs> uh, it's uh, good but, his stuff is good you should read it uh, <laughs> Casey pinned this as as a as almost like a military procedural type novel, and it's a really apt description of that book. And um, had I had that framework going into the book, I would have understood it a lot better before the three quarters of the way mark. Uh, <laughs> and um, it's the you mentioned that it's the the could be the beginning of a, a couple of other books. Are you looking to take this format into the other stories? Do you have other stories? I mean, you you, you mentioned that ten years after you die, though, right? Book two, but I, I'm assuming it's no, going to no, be sooner seven. than that. No, no, that will be books eleven through nineteen. After. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so what uh, what is the future for this? Uh, it comes out, I think, November 7th is the launch second. date for this. But second, second is the launch date. Uh, so obviously it's not a, yeah, nobody's read it at this time, only me because I'm special. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, what do you think you want to do for the future of this series? Do you have ideas for that? Oh, you might say so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all could die of old age before we ran out of ideas off sure. of this book, honestly. Like, yeah. I mean, you have, a, I mean, as a, as a standalone novel in and of itself, it's a great story uh, with really engaging characters. Um, and it just, you read it all the way through. And you, there's, I mean, I read it in two days all the way through. Um, and it's, 
it's one of those stories where you can just pick up. I mean, you could do whole anthologies off of the the characters that are in this book, and I think they would be all engaging. Uh, and I think that goes to the, the amount of research and, and work that you guys did to develop the characters for it. Well, thanks for the inherent compliment in that statement. Uh, well, 100%. But, <laughs> but so a couple of things. First, I can't take credit for the military procedural. That's Tom came up with that phrase. And I was like, yeah, you're exactly right. That's exactly what I, I didn't actually. Tam Keel, the gun girl. Ah, OK. Yeah. She came up with it one time trying to figure out what my books were. Yeah. Oh, OK, yeah. cool. And uh, um, and, you know, <laughs> See, that's this is the beautiful thing about alternate history, particularly point of departure alternate history, which is what we're writing here, right? Yeah. So the you know, Tom Tom is fond of, of telling us that the point of departure for this particular story is that dude takes an evening walk every night. In our universe, he turns left instead of right. That's the whole thing that right. sets yeah. off the whole thing. Right. And um the um um so because of that, there is, as you say, like just an infinite number of branches of this infinite uh, of this alternate history where things could be different. Things could be the same. Some things are different. Some things are the same. And so I think, um, you know, going forward. Yeah, we absolutely want to chase some of those threads down um, in the uh, you know, we're currently um, working on the second book. Um, we are uh, looking at following some of the threads of um kind of how does how does European royalty develop um, with the Romanovs not exterminated? You know, how does yeah. the presence of a of an empress in Russia change the kind of the global picture as far as that's concerned? Um, Be it noted, an empress who is of the social democrat wing of Tsarism. Right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, uh, a an empress who is arguably popular even or attempting to get popular with her people. Um, you know, because of what she's been through and what she's doing for them, um, mm -hmm. and who is aware of the sins of her parents, as it were. So, yeah. um, so that's one thread. You know, the other thread is is, well, there are many other threads. But how does oh, yeah. the presence of an armed imperial Russia change the scope of the twentieth century, or the right. you know the events of the twentieth century? How does World War II go? Um, what do the alliances look like? Is there a Cold War? How does that happen? Who is it between? You know, things of all that nature. Um, and so, so yeah, we have lots of ideas and lots of threads to follow. And Tom is not allowed to die before we're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you'll have to buy like a a, a grenade for every like <laughs> you do different time periods. It's like have a grenade uh, display case. That's well, right. what's funny is it's not the grenade that Tom almost immolated himself. With. <laughs> it was actually the. Uh, it was the uh, the coal mining light. Up oh, there, it is. There it is. So, oh, that sounds like a story we need to tell. Yes, yes. So artists must suffer for their art, right? <laughs> Tom Crapman is no exception. <laughs> this is one of the ones that worked, but I had one. Okay, you know what this is? I love. Wait a minute. I love that you started the story like that. That was great. <laughs> right. Tell us this what it is, is Tom, for people who are lamp. listening. This is a carbide lamp. You put carbide, calcium carbide, which looks a little bit like higher, higher, higher. There you like go. pebbles in there. Come on, close your miserable son of a bitch. You're one of the good ones. There we go. Water goes in here. This little lever adjusts the flow of the water right here. When the water starts hitting the calcium carbide, it gives off acetylene, which you can light by putting your palm of your hand over like this and doing that. And I got a rebuild kit so I could fix all of these. But I bought four of them, okay? And one of them I was testing, and sure as crap, didn't flames start shooting out the sides of it? <laughs> <laughs> and there was no place to put it. I couldn't put it in water. That just makes more acetylene. I couldn't put it down. That would burn something. So I sort of had to carry it around going. <laughs> <laughs> so, and broke the crap it. out of my hands while I was at it. Hurt like the devil. 
So that's, so can, that's three props so far. Is there any other props that you bought for this novel that we need to know about? Oh, Where's yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is actually really, yeah, this is really interesting. This is one of those writer problems you don't consider until, like, it's in your lap. Okay, do you remember the safe blowing exercise? Yes. And how much money they found in the safe? Yes. Originally, it was four times that amount of money because I was thinking the size of a U.S. currency. Oh, right. This is a Russian 100-ruble note from series 1910. Note, it is four times bigger than our currency, and wow. so the amount of currency found therein had to drop by a factor of four. <laughs> oh, so I definitely we... know of a couple of people that might call you out for that. <laughs> yeah, if anyone tries to rivet count us on yeah, this in yeah. terms of authenticity, yeah. they can kiss There's no way you can have that much money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. So Tom uh, is the world's answer to rivet counters. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Any any um we're we're running close to the end of the interview, but I I'm I'm curious. I'll uh, you know, as a writer, I I come up on problems that sometimes I get stuck on for days at a time. And and working on books by myself, usually it's just me banging my face against the keyboard until some magic answer appears on the screen. But I've been co-writing too, and a lot of times answers with co-writing you go to your co-author and you present a thing and they'll tell you something that you never would have thought of. And it fixes your problem. Uh, any, any situations that you guys can think of uh, during the writing of this process that, that somebody had a problem somewhere and, and you guys came together and solved it and it, it changed the book or made it better in some way. I'm not I saying know I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, was I, that Tom? I'm not saying, I'm not saying a word. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Well, what you, you've got some really strong personalities on your podcast. Not that your co-writers aren't. It's not what I'm saying. Right. But you've got a bunch of people who have led people in combat and have, you know, some kind of type A personalities. Casey's probably the most reasonable of us, but she was in goddamn Japan for the whole process. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, so often it was not, not, necessarily uh acrimonious but often it was negotiation for we all had an idea of what the solution should be uh and it was, negotiation tom had, tom's senior yeah. partner tom has final say but there was yeah. you know we talked it out you know we we hammered it out just like you would uh planning or an operation you know you don't you don't kill an idea just because it's not yours but eventually the commander says nope we're going with this yeah um so that's a lot of what happened is we both said ah, i think it should go here well i think it should go here um and and we did it Tom's way. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not entirely fair to that, me. That's not fair at all. Like Tom, yeah. Tom definitely doesn't have not invented here syndrome. He took he took good I the ideas he thought were good and used his experience to 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 know when to tell me to delete the you know 50 or 60 some odd pages yeah. that needed deleting. <laughs> Uh, Co-writing, I think, is probably one of the funnest experiences I've had as an author. Uh, Casey and I have written together a couple of times, and it's always been a blast. I, my first co-writing experience, I, uh, we were getting ready to launch this book, and and he reaches out and says, "I need a three thousand word chapter for a ground battle that's happening on here, and we don't have characters for that, so you're gonna have to develop those." And I, I was in <laughs> like like crunch mode for like two days <laughs> writing this entire chapter. And I, I got it to him in the nick of time. And he, as soon as I sent it to him, he sends me a Facebook message. Never mind. I figured out how to do it without it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, talked about I had written uh, great war chapters for um, Chekhov and Dostavlov, right? And yeah. keep in mind, all of us have read libraries, Tom more so than the rest of us, I, I, I think. But we've all read libraries worth of stuff about the Russian Civil War and World War I. And I had these chapters with Chekhov and Dostavlov taking part in Operation uh, Faustschlag, which is the last German offensive on the Eastern Front. And I really like them. Hopefully we can retool them a little bit and make them work. But Tom points out that, hey, Justin, um, these chapters, Operation Faustschlag was here. That's not changing on our timeline. And Chekhov and Dostavlov are already supposed to be in Siberia. Uh, <laughs> By that point. Oh, I had completely right. missed it. I had completely missed it after even after being immersed in research for weeks. I was like, oh, right. Sorry, Chief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So just just stuff like that, you know, where you, you you have so much thing you're really proud of it, and you're like, yeah, except it's 
completely impossible. (laughs) (laughs) So my, so my story is not like, it's not quite like that, but um, let me just say that of all of the people that I know, I think Tom is the Google foo champion of the world, right? Like this man can find shit on the internet. (laughs) So um, I'm writing the, I I had written all, I think, right, Tom, all of the, of the, um, uh, airship scenes with characters names. Cause initially we, we, he was like, yeah, we know the, we know the captain's name. Um, but we couldn't find the crew list. And I had written like all of them, uh, all the scenes that we were going to use. And he comes back, he's like, Hey, guess what I found? I found the crew list. <laughs> and I was like, nice. Oh, but this guy's name is like in my head, he exists as this other name, you know? Right. And he's like, well, pick one of these. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, okay, I guess I'll rename my guy, you know? <laughs> so, well, be accurate or not? <laughs> I did. No. Well, that- and, and, and it was, and it was a good move. It was just, it was one of those, like, those, like, um, what's the word, uh, moments of cognitive dissonance where you're like, you know, you create this person and right. in your head, that's their name. So we send but, him to court and we give him a name change. It's not, that's hard. right. And it was fine. It, these and it are not them. Great. These are their stunt doubles. (laughs) That's right. That's right. (laughs) Uh, So so that also begs the question, how did you find a crew manifest for a Zeppelin (laughs) that crashed in 1819? And everybody was not. uh, 1819. That's what I mean. 1918. Um, (laughs) Just have to find the right quarry. Yeah. Um, There's a monument to to the crew. If you look around some of the sites that have a picture of the monument, at least one of them has the crew manifest. Ah, interesting. And I think what I was looking for initially were pictures so Casey could describe some of them. Oh, right. And um, from the, but we can't match. There's no matching of the the crew photo. There's a a group photo of the crew. There's no matching of that to, um, to names. So yeah. we don't know who Mueller is, for example, right. in, that, in that picture. We only know he's there. Yeah. We know who the captain is. That one's easy. Uh, there's separate pictures of him, but there's no, at least I couldn't find a specific picture of Mueller or any of the other crew. But the manifest was there, and, you know, so we could pick and choose as we liked. Yeah. I have, I have this. Have you guys ever seen uh, Swordfish? It's a, a, a old movie from the 90s. It's a hacker movie. Yeah. I, when he was talking about looking at all these pictures and, and uh, match, this is the image I got was Hugh Jackman in front of like six computer screens, like <laughs> throwing <laughs> images around and typing and Googling and finding all this stuff. It's probably inaccurate, but that's what I saw. <laughs> no, just, it, it, it's not that. A lot of it's from law school. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but part of it is because I- I'm really difficult and insist on doing things my way. So, for example, if there's anybody here who's a, who are listening who is a lawyer, I never learned to shepherdize. Right. I found my own way to get the same information. I don't like shepherds. <laughs> That's I, don't way know, of finding... I have no idea what shepherdizing yeah, I don't means. Either. <laughs> What's that? It's a way of finding um, legal points and, and sites and matching them to cases so you're trying to prove something in a case and you shepherdize it and you find it's, this point has been used in all these cases and you read them and you pick and choose which ones you want. Well, I don't do that. Uh, I right. Every other lawyer in the world that I know of does that. I don't do that. I have, I have my, had my own way and worked just as well, if not better and faster. So if I can Google stuff, it's because I learned how to phrase things when I was in law school. Interesting. Uh, well, we are coming to the end of uh, the interview. I've been uh, directed to keep them uh, kind of condensed because I can talk forever. I know Casey can too. And uh, <laughs> um, I know that there's other guests that I've talked to. Our interviews have gone for two and a half hours. That have, They happen to also be Bane authors and their names happen to be David and Weber. Um, <laughs> and, oh, uh, <laughs> We're positive. <laughs> yeah. compared to Dave Weber. <laughs> He's not the worst sci-fi author for for running his mouth by any means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we'll leave it at that. Good night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so the, the Romanoff Rescue. Uh, I've got the 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 hardback. It's a phenomenal book. It comes out uh, November second, right? Uh, it'll be available on Amazon. It'll be av- available in bookstores. I highly recommend it. Uh, Tom. Casey, Justin, 
thank you all for sitting down with me and talking about the book. And uh, I, I know it's going to do well and I'm looking forward to see what comes after it and, and uh, the, the relationship that uh, you guys have built here. I'm, I'm looking forward to see that grow. So thank you guys for coming on the show. Yeah. One last point, us. Justin and I are doing a signing. Oh, okay. Um, on the, uh, in new Orleans on the evening of the 11th, and what Casey, up. you're telling me you're not going to fly in for that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can get those. leave. Garden <laughs> district books, books, right, Chief? <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah. What is it now? Garden district books. In appropriately, the Garden District of New Orleans will be there November 11th, starting at 6 p.m. Right. Just now, give a little talk, and in. then we'll sign. Excellent. Very cool. That sounds uh, well, I hope, I'm jealous. hope you have a great uh, turnout and uh, thank you guys again for coming on the show. It was a great conversation. I thought me too. Thanks. Thanks. Josh. And now Thanks. back to the podcast. And now we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of John Ringo's live free or die. Two. As he drove back to Boston on Monday, Tyler had to admit that he'd much rather work for Chuck on day shift. When he'd gone to the general manager and asked if he could scrounge through the rejects that were being returned, Chuck had just waved. Among other things, Chuck was a fan, and while that didn't get Tyler many points, it allowed them to communicate better. People didn't generally buy something in grocery stores that was dinged, scratched, or otherwise marred. They'd eat stuff that had so little nutrition that they might as well eat the box, but woe betide if the box was crushed. So anything that wasn't visually perfect got sent back to the vendors and either got credited or sold through outlets. There were rules against giving it to most food banks, for that matter. Most of it was just thrown away. Most of the damage occurred over the weekend, so Tyler had plenty of stuff to pick through, and he'd gotten just about one of everything. The likelihood of any of it being compatible with the glatun, much less valuable, was small. But long shots occasionally hit, and it was this or cut trees. Tyler really wanted to wangle a ride on the ship. There was no way that was going to fly, but it was a childhood dream. He hadn't just come up with trade hard on the spur of the moment. He'd wanted to be Wathayat from the time he was a kid. His grandfather was in his sixties before they ever met, but he remembered the old man's stories like they were yesterday. Granda had been a crewman, eventually rising to captain, on tramp steamers that plied the South Seas trade back when they were still converting from sail to steam. His stories of trading for copra, fights with gangs in pre-communist Shanghai, and, as they both got older, beautiful island maidens, were some of the highlights of Tyler's childhood. That and books, mostly SF books, once he found them. Combine Norton and Heinlein, and Powell Anderson, with Granda, and you got trade hard, what Tyler really wanted to do when he grew up. He considered going into the merchant marine rather than college, but it simply wasn't the same as when Granda was a crewman. American crewmen, especially, ran under so many rules, unions, and regulations that it wasn't much different from being part of any other corporation. The soul was gone from it. Space, though, had to be different. There was just too much variety available. Sure, there were problems, but they'd be bigger, grander. So for two fifteen-minute speeches, you managed to make our gate fees? Drath said sourly. The ship's purser blew out a line of spittle and recovered it and that only by smuggling out that guy's stash of gold coins. How the hell did he hang on to those, by the way? 
Look up survivalist, Wathayet said. It's a really bizarre religion these people have. Unless we can find a rich buyer with a queer Jones for alien folk art, we're not going to make fuel. And that doesn't count the damned mortgage. We are so screwed. I know, Wathay had said, lifting his mane in a shrug. I'm meeting that guy who used to do the Trade Hard comic. He's bringing some stuff for me to look at. Not much chance any of it will be worth anything, but at this point... It's about all we can hope, Drath said. Well, I hear Norada Lines is hiring. Back to being a cargo handler. Yeah, good for you, Wathay had said. I'm not qualified on anything bigger than a class four. I'm going to be doing the Tranet run for the rest of my life. I hate Tranet Station. It's a damned gas mine. There aren't even any good bars. Hi, Tyler said to the armed guard at the gate. The spinward crossing, which was smaller than he'd realized, was tucked into a warehouse in a half-finished industrial park near Reading. Why they'd picked the Boston area was anyone's guess. Most of the ships that had landed in the U.S. had landed near Washington or L.A. Vernon Tyler? I'm supposed to meet with Captain Wathayet? Yes, sir, the security guard said, consulting a list. Could I see some ID? Why are there guards on the ship? Tyler asked. Believe it or not, some people can't sort out the difference between Glatun and our Horvath benefactors, the guard said, handing back his ID. So far, we haven't had any protesters, but there have been incidents in other countries. Ah... Tyler said. I'm not going to cause an incident. No, sir, the guard said, opening the gate. Have a nice day. Captain Wathayet, Tyler said, as he parked the pickup. He'd been directed to bring it actually into the warehouse, so he was able to park it right by the ship. That was after another security check which had searched the back and underside of the pickup, presumably for bombs. Mr. Vernon, Wathayet said, stepping down from the cargo ramp. A pleasure to see you again. What have you brought? Rare and costly viands from the four corners of the earth, Tyler said cheerfully. You'll understand if I don't get into exactly what rare and costly viands. Of course. Wathayet said, as Tyler started unloading. Bring them up in the ship. I've set up a table and some chairs. It occurred to me, after we made this agreement, that I was placing myself in trade against the writer of Trade Hard. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Those who can do, those who can't write, Tyler said, pulling out a set of trays with Dixie cups on them. The Dixie cups had been the most expensive part, I really got no experience of this sort of thing. Even if we find something, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get screwed. I have prepared 223 different possible trade items for your examination. Each of them is of the highest possible quality and chosen from some of the rarest and most sought-after substances on Earth. You're behind on your cell phone bill, and your ex is still looking at the email she hasn't sent about being behind on your child support payment, Wathay had said, taking out a small hand scanner and starting to scan the cups. I'm pretty sure that these are from the tossed-out trash in the stockroom of your store, but it's not under surveillance or in inventory, so I'm not positive. Bastard, Tyler muttered setting the cups down on the table. It looked to be some sort of polymer and was sort of scratched and worn. For that matter, the small hold, he supposed, was beat to hell. I hate it when people know more about my life than I do. Like I said, Wathayet said, it's like trying not to look through an open window. Nothing, nothing, Poisonous as hell, which is interesting. What's that? Tyler asked. Thirty-seven. 
Wow. If we ever do get into regular trade with your people, don't ever, ever accept a Coke. I thought that was what it was, what they had said. We'd been warned, and our implants can process it. Would only make us mildly ill. This one is interesting. Not for us. It's compatible with Rangora systems. Not sure what it would taste like to them. As he was scanning, he was picking up and sniffing anything that wasn't registering as toxic. He paused with one and set down his scanner. His snout practically turned inside out as he gave a long sniff. The mane that ran down his back stood up like a startled cat. This smells, Wathay had said, carefully dipping a finger into the yellow gold syrup. He took a small taste and rolled it around in his mouth. This is... Suddenly he drove his snout into the cup and began licking frantically. You okay? Tyler asked worriedly. Yeah, Wathay had said. His tone wasn't muffled because he wasn't actually opening his mouth. But it should have been because his snout, which was just a bit too wide, had ripped open the Dixie cup and was covered in a golden tarry substance. A long purple tongue emerged and began licking the substance off. What is this stuff? On the long shot, which seemed to be playing out, that something would be compatible and interesting to the glatun, Tyler had put the various foodstuffs into cups and marked them with numbers. That way, only he knew what they were. The 156 was barely visible since it had been ripped. Ha, huh, Tyler said, consulting a handwritten list. Dragon's tears. Figured it would be that. What? Is dr wab wheat? The glatun shook his head and opened his mouth. Gargla for wallopal. What is dragon's tears? The collar transmitter asked. Did you just speak, glatun? Tyler asked. More or less, what they had said, shaking his head. I couldn't handle my plants for a second. That stuff has a kick. I think we might be on to a winner here. What is Dragon's Tears? It's not anywhere on your information systems. Tears of a dragon, Tyler said. Nearly impossible to get, very rare and almost secret. You have to make a dragon laugh and cry to get them. First, you have to tell a dragon ten jokes it's never heard before. If you tell it one joke it's heard, you have to start over again. And you'd better tell him fast and well, or it will eat you. If you make it through that, then you have to tell it ten sad stories that make it cry. When it starts to cry, you dash forward and catch the tears. You are such a liar, what they had said. First of all, dragons are a legend like the trockle of my people. Second, if something was that rare and costly, you couldn't afford it. Third, all my instruments say that this came from a plant. True, but it's going to make great marketing, Tyler said. You got any more? Wathay had said, contemplating the empty cup with slumped shoulders. Seriously, this is really good. Who knew? I've got some more, Tyler said. No cameras that could see in the truck bed but seriously, I do need some trade for it. I'll get some more out of the back of the truck and we'll trade. When Tyler got back, there wasn't one glatun, but three clustered around a table. He'd brought a squeeze bottle and some Dixie cups. Why don't we try mixing it with a little water? Tyler said. I don't have enough to fill these cups. I'm thinking hundred weight of Atacirc per weight of tears. You've got to be joking, one of the glatuns snapped. They pretty much looked alike, but this one had a longer snout than Wathayet and darker blue skin. Hey, Tyler, Wathayet said, the collar transmitter faithfully replicating his slur. Meet Drath, 
He's the purser, handles all the cargo and stuff, and Fabbit's an en engi ship's engineer, Fabbit said, leaning forward. So what is this stuff? Dragon's tears, Tyler said, squirting a generous measure into a cup and handing it to the purser. If he was reading things right, the purser was going to be the guy he needed as hammered as possible for the negotiations. Very rare and precious. Not worth a hundred weight of circuitry, Drath said, taking a sniff. It was the same reaction as before. Light sniff, heavy sniff, nose dive. Whoo! Guys! Tyler said, filling cups. This stuff really is expensive. Slow down. Here, what they had said, reaching into a pocket. You guys like this crap? It's trash, but is better than your trash. He rolled a handful of Atacirc onto the table and waved. Keep it. Got any more? Tyler carefully scooped up the fortune in circuitry and poured some more dragon's tears in the captain's cup. Gorbel computers on this planet, Fabbit slurred. He'd had about three ounces total. Total trash. Got the stuff for a scrap. Is scrap. Ha! It's like hundred years old. <laughs> it's good stuff, this. Shh, Drath whispered, waving a hand around. Shh, humans can't know that. Think it's collar stones or something. He appeared to sneeze several times. So, Drath, Tyler said neutrally, this appears to have some trade value. It is, as I said, a very rare and costly viand on this planet. I think a hundred weight to one is perfectly reasonable. Me too, the engineer said. Stuff will sell for a bazillion credits on Glaucod Station. Shh, Drath said. Shh. Well, Mr. Vernon, he continued, straightening his harness, this does seem to have some merit, as you say, but not gr great, and at a cirque is also very rare and costly. Your engineer just said you bought it for scrap, Tyler said. Scrap! And we're gonna get rich! He... Exaggerates. I think that a rate of 50 weight of this dragon's tears to one weight of Molliserk would be more in order. So, two weight of atomic level circuitry to one weight of dragon's tears, Tyler said. We have a deal? I don't know, Fabbit said. You got any more? I think that is a fair trade. Drath said slowly and distinctly. His head twitched several times rapidly. How do your people finalize such things under your laws? And are they considered binding? Tyler asked. That's a little complicated, what they had said. Binding contracts shall be established by verbal confirmation of all parties in the presence of a federally authorized contracting hypernode system. Drath quoted clearly. All trade ships as well as banks and public places of consumption are required by law to have such locked systems present for the closure of contracts, and such contracts are considered both proprietary and binding reference Federal Code 1147983LQ5, something like that. So, you guys agree verbally, and you're bound? Tyler asked. Try to get a judge out here, Fabbit said. Or, and this is an important point, a commercial authority seizure party. Shh, Drath said. Are you in agreement or not? I don't know, Tyler said woefully. I'm feeling like you guys are going to screw me somehow. You've got the ship and all. We're not going to screw you, man what they had said, waving a cup. We're buddies. Okay, Tyler said mournfully. I'm practically giving this stuff away, but if 
that's as much as he'll go. I agree to two weights of Atacirc for one weight of the substance designated Product 156, nicknamed Dragon's Tears. Ha! Trath crowed. You're bound now, baby. Agreed, Wathay had said. Feeling screwed? Very, Tyler said, his shoulders slumping. You should, Drath said, taking a sip of the now watered down dragon's tears. We're going to get rich with this stuff. How much can you get? It is actually fairly rare, Tyler said. And the real problem is the Horvath. They're not going to interfere with our trade, what they had said. They know better than to mess with a Glatun ship. No, they won't, Tyler said. But I can't get my hands on a full cargo of this right away. And if they find out what you're trading, they'll come and take it. If they can, because it's a lot harder to obtain than mining for stuff. War, destruction, no dragon steers. Point, what they had said, his crest fluttering. So we smuggle it out. Good thing you're dealing with us, then, Fabbit said. Look, it was only once, okay, Drath said. People act like I made a career out of it. The Horvath own our communications, Tyler said. And even if you can hack them, they're going to be paying attention to anyone who meets with you guys. Point, what they had said. But we can disappear easily enough. You can? Tyler said. To them, yeah, Drath said. There's an open field which doesn't have much observation near your home. Meet us there. When can you get more of this? Tell you what, Tyler said, thinking rapidly. I'll bring as much dragon tears as I can fit in the back of my truck. I can trade this at a circ for... I should be able to afford that much. The stuff really is expensive. You guys fill the back with Atacirc and we're golden. You sure you can spoof the Horvath? Yeah, what they had said more clearly. Even if they're paying attention to you, they won't see you leave your house. We'll try to make sure they don't know what you're picking up. And you'll forgive me if I point out I'm going to try to keep you from finding out, Tyler said. I could probably get it by Tuesday night. Tuesday night at 9 p.m., Drath said. It's called Homer's Farm, but there's no farm there. Long story, Tyler said. Okay, I'll be there. Two weights to one. I'm being screwed. Great, Fabbit said. You're going to bring more, right? As Tyler drove out of the industrial park, he carefully pulled his cell phone out and set it on the dash where it could easily pick up his voice. Well, that was a bust. What the hell am I going to do for money now? Those stupid aliens, damn glad tun, laughing at me. Like they really like the sketched bastards. What am I going to do now? Maybe Jeff Morris over at AT&T has got some consultant work. Since I'm in Boston, might as well check. He felt like an idiot, but if he was going to get his hands on a truckload of Product 156 by tomorrow night, he'd better hurry. He kept a glare on his face as he fought his way through Boston traffic and tried very hard not to break out in gales of hysterical laughter. Hey, Tyler. Long time. Tyler and Jeff Morris weren't exactly friends. They just knew each other. Both had started off in the industry about the same time. They'd worked together a couple of times in different companies. Sometimes they were competitors, a couple of times while working for the same company. IT was like that. Right now, though, Jeff Morris wasn't looking exactly pleased to see his old acquaintance. Jeff had managed to not only survive when so many had fallen, he'd finally worked his way into an office, which in IT generally meant he could make hiring decisions. And he probably had every guy he'd ever sort of talked to at Comdex begging for a slot. Any slot. 
Hey, Jeff. You mentioned that you had a project called Babylon you were working on, and I might be interested, Tyler said, sitting down and picking up a yellow pad. He'd looked for cameras on the way in, and the only one was on the monitor, and it was pointed at Jeff. Babylon, Jeff said, puzzled. Yeah, Tyler said, not looking up. Had to do with a lass. He held up the pad, which said in great big letters, Secure Room, Now. Babylon, Jeff said, slapping his forehead. Sorry, we changed the project name. It's... He paused and looked around for inspiration. Seafid. It's called Seafid now, but it's really secure. We'd probably better talk in a shield room. Seafid? Tyler said as soon as he was sure the room was secure. C++ for idiots, Jeff said. It was a book on the wall. And you've got a lot of nerve making fun of that. Alas, Babylon? Jesus Christ, how did you even know I'd read that book? Saw it on a shelf one time at a party at your house, Tyler said. Only thing even close to SF, so it caught my eye. How's Mel? Pregnant again, Jeff said. Nice to see you and all, as I said, but why is my department being charged a thousand dollars an hour to use the shield room? This, Tyler said, pulling his hand out of his pocket and rolling the handful of Atacirc out on the table. I need a million dollars, quickly, and I need a hundred grand of that in cash. Is this from the sp Binward Crossing? Jeff asked, picking up one of the chips gingerly. Where else? You found something they want to trade? Jeff said. It's not worth a mill. A lot, yeah, not a mill. Among other things, about one in ten of the stuff the Spinward Crossing has been selling doesn't work, and I can't authorize that sort of money. I'm going to have more quite a bit. I need AT&T to get some people in here to buy it from multiple companies. I'll cut AT&T in on 1% of whatever I make for being the house. And obviously, we need to keep this quiet. Nothing electronic. Agreed, Jeff said. But as I said, I can't authorize any of that. I know that, Jeff, Tyler said, sitting down which means you need to shag your ass to the 35th floor. I also can't simply walk in on Weasley Rail, Jeff said nervously. You can if you're holding a million dollars in Atacirc in your hand, Tyler said. Weasel won't mind, really, especially since this deal ends on Wednesday. Call him Weasel to his face, and it won't matter how much Atacirc you're holding, Jeff said, sighing. Okay, okay. I'll need to take, take as many as he'd like, Tyler said, waving expansively. That was another installment in our ongoing serialization of John Ringo's Live Free or Die. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Thanks to Josh Hayes for conducting our interview today. And praise, thanks, and gratitude to Tom Kratman, Justin Watson, and Casey Azell for sitting down and speaking with him. And good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirerod coming to you from a soundproof booth somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.